So for this week's uh, episode in the Jewels of Quakerism series, we're going to be talking uh, broadly about spiritual gifts and community. We're going to talk about the variety of spiritual gifts, both historically and as contemporarily understood in the Society of Friends. We're going to look at some of the scriptural references from Paul's letters, the Romans, Corinthians, and Ephesians in terms of the scriptural basis for the spiritual gifts. We'll talk about the variety of spiritual gifts in Friends meetings and the process that's outlined for the naming and recognition and claiming and exercising of gifts in community. We'll talk a little bit about the difference between prophecy, ministry, and spiritual gifts. And then we'll talk about how all of this stuff kind of gets built up within um, a church community or a congregation, a meeting community, and how all that is finally kind of brought to fruit and fruition. And it begins to serve to kind of mend the, the world and to bring more joy into it. We'll close by talking about some of the um, issues that can come up regarding ministry and gifts and our vision of what can come in the future. So scripturally, the spiritual gifts um, are most explicitly lifted in Paul's letters. Uh, and specifically, it's in Romans, uh, Corinthians, and Ephesians. And Rome, those are some places where folks look directly uh, to find some of the spiritual gifts names. Now, depending on your orientation within uh, Christianity and different denominations and sects of Christianity, some folks are very um, rigid and literal about that, which is to say only certain scriptural gifts exist, and these are the ones named by Paul, dun 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 dun. Some folks who are um, cessationalists or, or endedists uh, say that the spiritual gifts are no longer available. For example, um, apostleship or ap the apostolic gifts were given out to the apostles and no more. Um, and so certain gifts were present at one point in time biblic in biblical history but no longer available. And so those kinds of theological arguments I'm not so interested in here, but I am interested in giving some folks some um, scriptural references to know um, kind of in conversation with, with other folks from different denominations, you know, where is it that uh, folks come to? So, of three. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And just as each one has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. And if a man's gift is prophesying, then let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So what's being lifted up there uh, in, in Romans is that you know, we are each given, and the, the friends talk about is we're each given some measure of light and then unto us more is given. So that we each have different roles to play. And he talks um, later in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians um, 12, 12, the body metaphor. And he said, you know, if does the hand want what the foot wants? And if the foot wants what the hand wants, we the whole body would be made up of hands and then the body wouldn't function. So there's this idea that each of us is apportioned the right thing for us and that somehow we fit into this greater body. And that's, you know, the language of that is the body of Christ, the body of the true church, the body of believers, but we're all some kind of portion and we serve some crucial function in that you know, in that metaphorical body of the church. Um, so these gifts are all portioned separately, and they're um, all for the edification of that greater body, not just for itself. You know, the eye doesn't exist just for the eye. The eye exists for the whole of the body, and that is the body of the church. Uh, so some of the gifts, what are the ones that are actually listed in Scripture? Um, and so if we look, we'll just kind of go through those three areas. In Ephesians... Uh, Paul writes about the gifts of apostleship, of prophecy, of evangelism, of pastoral um, care, and of teaching. So uh, then we move on to Romans, and in Romans 12, 6 through 8, we list again prophecy, 
uh, ministry, teaching, uh, exhortation, encouragement, giving, leadership, and showing of mercy, as the passage I just read. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 14, it lists wisdom, knowledge, the discerning of spirits, uh, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, faith, working of miracles, and healing. And so these three different categories in Romans, Ephesians, and Corinthians, they're often listed as a very, and specifically pointed to as the place where the, the, the gifts are found. So as we mentioned before, one of the things that's important is that though scripture provides kind of the framework and the foundation for early friends, especially their understanding of the spiritual gifts, owing to this theological kind of presumption and experience of the power of spirit and creation in continuing revelation, it's also true that contemporary friends understand that there are spiritual gifts not explicitly named in scripture that are in fact real. And there's a couple ways to think about that. Some of it might be that we have a deeper understanding of certain aspects of human life. Not necessarily better, but kind of of different categorical analysis. So, for example, there's a ministry of healing named in scripture. Well, it's also true that there's psychological healing, there's sociological reconciliation, there's physical healing and the medical arts. So all those things might head under the ministry of healing of the gift of spirit and healing, even though they're not all there. So um, the fact that they're not named specifically in the text isn't as much of a concern as long as the sense of folks and their discernment is that the leading of the spirit is in fact there and it's building up the community somehow and it's helping to mend the world. A scriptural reference for this, for the understanding of the manifestations of the Spirit in this kind of broad understanding, is very fascinating. And if we look at some of the Greek that Paul would have been writing in, or that we have some of the early pieces of the New Testament in Paul's letters in, there's something uh, very indicative there. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. And that first line is particularly relevant because the line in the English is now about spiritual gifts. But in fact, in the Greek, uh, spiritual gifts is not there, and gifts is a word that's added in into the English translation. And the word that's used there is, is pneumatikos, and the pneumatikos word um, comes from this same pneuma, refuma, and that word is in English in places like pneumonia, pneumatic, and it's that pneuma of breath, right, of the, the pressure of the air. So that word pneuma is both breath and spirit. So that pneumatikos um, is from this word and in Strong's uh, Greek dictionary he says this is um, non-carnal, that is ethereal or spirit-based. So that's fascinating. So what's um, pneumatikos? Pneumatikos is this, this spiritual. So in English it says now about these spiritual gifts, but in the Greek it's more something like and now about the manifestations of the spirit. And I think that's really great because the idea of a gift to a lot of folks in English sounds like something that you were given because you're a good person. And maybe it's your birthday or maybe it's a holiday or a festival and you deserve it because you've been good. It's the kind of consumeristic Santa Claus Christmas model. If you've been a good kid, you'll get a gift. If not, you'll get a bad thing. And that is not what's being expressed here. This is a spiritual upwelling, a manifestation of the spirit. It's not something that as a minister, I, I might own, like this is my gift, I claim it, it makes me me. It's something that we steward. It's something given to our care for the building up of the body. And in the places where the word gifts actually appears in the Greek, the word that's used is charisma. So that person has charisma, and that sense of the word in English doesn't appear until the 20th century. Charisma is actually a gift of the spirit. The, the care part of charisma is in the same root of the word caritas and charity. It's this freely given thing through grace. It's not because you deserved it or you're a good person. It's this freely given gift of the spirit. So that when I talk about gifts of the Spirit, and I think in general, when friends understand the gifts of the Spirit, we're not talking about particular skills that someone's good at, per se. What we're talking about is this manifestation of the Spirit, kind of the breath of the Spirit on the body of the church, the emanation, the kind of bubbling forth of creativity and goodwill and love and hope and charity and all of those things and the ways that spirit works in humans in the world to bring about mending and some piece of the corner of that kingdom of heaven, that peaceable place that we're all working towards in gospel order. 
throughout this video, we're grateful to the scholarship and to the thoughtful and prayerful work of many friends. And in this section in particularly, I'm going to refer to the work of Patricia Loring in her book, Listening Spirituality, Volume 2, The Corporate Spiritual Practices of Friends, and also to the Pendle Hill pamphlet by Marty Grundy, Tall Poppies, The Supporting Gifts of Ministry and Eldering in Friends Meetings. Um, both these books have made great contribution to the analysis of the contemporary naming and supporting of gifts in, in uh, Friends Meetings. The variety of gifts in Friends Meetings are greater than those that are listed in Scripture. And, and that would make sense because as friends we are have a belief in continuing revelation that spirit continues to reveal truth and as we adapt to new situations in the world it would make sense that new gifts of the spirit are called into community for the mending of that world oh. contemporarily in in liberal friends meetings when we talk about naming uh, gifts of the spirit we tend to lump them into two discrete categories, ministers and elders. Ministers being limited mostly to vocal ministry and gospel ministers, which people who are skilled with vocal ministry. And elders as those who nurture and support and ground ministers as well as hold and pray for and nurture the meeting, often participating in the naming and, and calling out of those ministers. Um, but the, the, there's a much more continuous amount of gifts that are available to the friends meeting. And we can sometimes see that in the category of ministry, that our ministry is the exercise of our gifts in service to the meeting. I, I want to illustrate this by reading a quote from Patricia Loring, who says in her book, Listening Spirituality, at a deeper level, Ministry refers to service as ways in which each of us brings to one another the measure of the spirit we have received in the particular manner we have received it. We are ministering life-giving spirit of God to one another in countless nameable and unnameable ways. To call one another to live more consciously and with more commitment into our gifts and their implications is to invite one another into more abundant life. Each person who opens himself up to more abundant life open, opens more abundant life for the community as a whole. And here we see the overlap between the faithful naming and nurturing of our gifts and the movement of the community towards gospel order that it's by calling into service of the community all of those gifts that are given to us that we can mend the world, that we begin both on that process and towards the goal of gospel order, of the right relationship of the creation to itself and to the creator as well. Who's responsible for this naming and, and nurturing of gifts? We'll talk a little bit later about the work of the nominating committee in the meeting, uh, but I want to lay some groundwork by reading another quote from Patricia Loring, where she talks about the fact that we are all, as we are each of another, responsible for knowing each other well enough to be able to see and to name and to pull out from each other those gifts that can be in service to community. That's that work of knowing each other and that which is eternal, of nudging each other and suggesting that a friend might want to be the one who travels to a certain conference because even though it wouldn't have occurred to her, it builds up a gift that is being recognized in that friend. Patricia Loring writes, Another dimension of our listening is attentiveness to the specific gifts of others. Discernment and nurture of gifts were the traditional gifts of elders. It is important to remember that some people really do have a special gift for it, that being the naming of gifts and others. But we must remember, however, that all of us bear some measure of responsibility for discerning, evoking, and encouraging one another in this way. It is assumed to be everyone's task, and it is often treated as if it's nobody's responsibility. 
So, so what this says is that the more we are in fellowship with each other, the more we are in community with each other and know and see the embryonic gifts in each other, we can begin to pull those out, to talk to others in the meeting, to work together, to, to name and call into service of the meeting as a whole those gifts that we see in each other and, and hope that the members of our community will hold up a mirror for us as well. We've talked about the scriptural basis and some of the different and contemporary ways that friends understand the naming of gifts. But beyond the theoretical understanding of this, what does it look like in practice? We wanted to explore that. And, and in order to do that, we're greatly indebted to the work of Lloyd Lee Wilson and his book, Essays on a Quaker Vision of Gospel Order, in which in his chapter on community stewardship of our spiritual gifts, he lays out for us really six steps, six tasks, if you will, for the community of the stewardship of spiritual gifts. And I just want us to hold up that it really is a process for both the community and the individual. That the community's role in naming, claiming, and stewarding spiritual gifts is vital, not only because it's very difficult for us to see ourselves clearly, much better for others to do that seeing. It also protects against uh, the kind of the power and that insistence of the ego to be important, to be self-important. And this process of coming into our spiritual gifts is really a process of coming into service to the meeting, into to service of spirit. And uh, it involves stripping away parts of the ego, and we do that with help of our community and divine guidance. So um, I'm going to launch right into the list of those six steps that he delineates. The first one is obviously the naming of our spiritual gifts. And he writes that to perceive and name them properly is a joint responsibility. The emphasis falls on the work of the faith community rather than the individual. It is the faith community's responsibility to name the giftedness of its members because we cannot see ourselves clearly. I spoke about that and he goes on to say, the sense of giftedness and understanding of the nature of the gift is mightily strengthened and clarified by the stated discernment of the faith community. That testing that ha happens in the faith community, that corporate discernment, is an important part of naming whether it's a true gift of the spirit or perhaps a talent or a skill that a friend has. And so that's another reason that it's important to have this naming happen in community. One piece that Lloyd Lee Wilson lifts up that I think is important to mention about naming of spiritual gifts is that as a community, we need to be sensitive and we need to be plain about the naming of the withdrawal of spiritual gifts. If spiritual gift is an inbreaking and upwilling of the spirit for use in community, there are times when it's withdrawn. And we need to be faithful in supporting friends when that gift is withdrawn in, in the process of laying down the work and also when um, that giftedness has friends serving on committees or clerking meetings to begin the process of laying down that committee appointment or that clerkship of being true to the gift when it's present and also when it's not present. That's hard work that can be softened by the love of community hand in hand with naming gifts is the piece of claiming. Claiming is primarily that work in the individual when she says, I am ready to take on the work. I recognize also this gift and am willing to do the work that is required of me to live into it. And that, that claiming piece leads directly into the third task or third step which is the consecration of the gift. And um, so by claiming the gift as, as ours and, and being willing to be of service to the gift and to the community, to the divine, concentration, the <laughs> consecration 
is the process of self-evaluation in the light of the acceptance of this gift. And along with the community, identifying those pieces of the self that might need to fall away in order to be faithful to the gift. We may need to change habits to let go of certain practices in order to order our lives that we may be in service to the gift. It's similar to the process of conversion of manners in the conviction, convincement, conversion process of friends, converting our lives to the truth we know, converting our lives to faithfulness and service to the gift, that consecration of ourselves to service for the gift. The fourth step, and really the fourth step in what he calls preparation, um, this preparation phase for the use of our spiritual gifts, is developing our spiritual gifts. And this is both the work of the individual and of the community. And it happens by knowing each other more closely. The work of the individual in developing and living into the gift, and the work of the community in being able to see, comment, nudge each other into more faithful um, stewardship of that gift. Loyally writes, because we know and trust one another in Christ, it becomes much easier to share a word of advice, caution, or encouragement without fear of being misunderstood or offensive. These first four tasks, the naming, claiming, consecrating, and developing, are all in preparation for the last two tasks, exercising the gift and receiving the fruit of the gift. Exercising the gift is about the use of this gift in the meeting community or beyond the meeting community. And it's both incumbent upon the individual in her faithfulness in using the gift when opportunities avail themselves, but also the community may see and make known to the gifted individual opportunities for her to travel beyond the meeting community and to exercise this gift in service to the spirit. There may be that a gift of healing has been recognized and a particular conference or event in which an individual might well use this gift is known about and brought to the individual by someone else in her meeting so that she might go into the world and to use this gift faithfully. So the exercising of the gift is both the individual and the meeting itself. And it leads directly into the last step that he, that he lays before us, which is the receiving the fruits of the gift, of the spiritual gift. Um, I'm going to read from his text. Receiving the fruits of those gifts is a joint task, but one that falls with special emphasis on the faith community. After all that has been discussed has been done to ensure good stewardship of the gifts God has given us, we can still be unfaithful by refusing to be ministered to by those gifted friends among us. Just as the best educated, trained, and equipped doctor would be unable to carry out his or her calling if no one came to be healed, the most gifted individual cannot minister if there is no one willing to receive that ministry. And I think that's twofold. One is that the gifts of ministry as they're named for use in the community get drawn out as the community is willing to draw them out of the minister for service and community. And the amount that we are willing to listen and receive ministry to change our own lives, to conform to the truth that's made known to us, brings more of a measure of light um, to the minister and subsequently to the community for service to the community. Now, um, a lot of this that has to do with those tasks of, of, of stewarding the, uh, those spiritual gifts, it can be understood kind of in this little visual diagram that we've got. And for folks that are visual learners, this might be useful. So if you take a look at this image, what you'll see is something that is a large circle, and that large circle is community. And then in the individuals are those smaller circles within it. And what you'll see is that in that small uh, circle, the very smallest, well, that's a representation of whatever this gift is. And there's two things going on here. Inside the individual, there is this gift, this seed, this upwelling of spirit rising. And the individual has to tend to it. Those arrows are... Um, 
kind of significations of that. But also, the individual who is internally tending to this gift and stewarding it is also being nourished and held accountable by his or her community. So those larger arrows are the community support, helping the person internally support their gift. Now, this can happen one or or of the other ways. It could be that the person notices the gift first, that those internal arrows start to kind of blink before the other ones, or it could be that the uh, community notices those gifts first and the community starts encouraging it. It could go either way and sometimes it goes in parallel, but it's important that it's not one or the other always. We notice something's happening in ourselves and we go to our community and sometimes the community notices something in us and comes to us. Well, as we proceed along, what happens is that that gift continues to grow and develop, and then it is continued to be supported, 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 until finally um, that gift has grown and been exercised and it starts to bear fruit. And the individual begins to offer ministry in the meeting, whether it's healing or administration or service or compassion, and it lifts up the body, not only within the church, but the folks that are being served um, by it. So any people who are being brought together into this uh, gospel order and into the kingdom. Now, what can happen there is that the, the community feels nourished by it. And incredibly important to the model is that it's not just the individual that this is happening to. The model is expanded and in fact what's happening always and in flux, the meeting is in the process of lifting up these gifts in everyone. So this is a process incurring in everyone and everyone has one or more gifts being lifted up and nourishing and encouraging each other. And so that lush growth kind of helps usher in that uh, gospel order. And we are helping each other live into that which is inside of us and eternal and powerful and of use and of service. And so the individual's relationship with the community is incredibly important. And friends used early on this word that has come into some um, less use, which is discipline. Friends are to live under the discipline of their meeting. Now that word, as well as some of the word elder, has a very finger-shaking quality to it, especially today. But there's something underneath it that's pretty powerful. So discipline obviously comes from disciple, and some people shy away from that word because they think it's very much like uh, blind following whatever anyone says, and it's just this kind of um, religious fervor of canceling out all rational thought and just kind of zombie-like walking to whatever someone tells you to do. And in fact, the word discipline, um, when it's taken apart etymologically, comes from dis and capere. And dis means apart from and uh, capere means to take. So it's really about taking things apart, understanding. It's about analysis. And for friends, I think it's incredibly important to understand where we took the word friends from in the uh, first place. And so in John 15, uh, 14 to 15, 15, there's a powerful piece in scripture that's incredibly relevant to this discipline thing. Uh, it says, uh, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I have made known to you. So friends were friends not because they blindly did whatever they were told by the Lord, but because they understood that their peace in this whole process was to bring things about. They didn't just respond and say, yes, whatever you say. They said, tell us what the whole picture is. Help us discern how we might be of use and where we can kind of put our hands and feet to work and service. So this discipline isn't just about blind obedience. It's about understanding. It's about knowing your part in the growing kingdom. It's about knowing that you can connect to your brothers and sisters and help usher in uh, fellowship and joy. So this idea of a blind religiosity, which about discipleship, is something we need to abandon. And there is a measure of surrender that's there, but it's also a knowledgeable surrender. It's an analytical one. It's also a discapere, a discipled one, a disciplined one. So we live in connection with our meeting, trusting and respecting that people will live faithfully and doing discernment and helping lift each other up where we fall down and help hold each other accountable so that we can all nourish those gifts of the Spirit that are rising inside of us. So as we've been discussing this, we've kind of been going back and forth between some traditional understandings, some scriptural understandings, and also the writings of some contemporary friends. So, so I think it's also important to give folks kind of a snapshot of where we are in 2009. And that is, many of the conservative yearly meetings still have an understanding of some of these practices. It's funny to say conservative yearly meetings, many of them, because there's three. <laughs> um, but Iowa uh, and Ohio and North Carolina 
to my knowledge, all have some continuing conversation regarding spiritual gifts and ministry and um, oversight and eldership and things of that nature. And uh, the accountability part of there is at least a part of the dialogue, if not kind of uh, monolithic. The liberal meetings um, in the United States, those associated with FGC as well as um, the West Coast meetings of North Pacific, Pacific and Intermountain yearly meetings, the independent yearly meetings, are um, in flux about this. There's been some discussion and over the past 15 or, or 20 or so years there has been some um, conversation regarding the emergence of these gifts and you know maybe having uh, more conversation in the meetings about the, the spiritual life and uh, things of that nature. Uh, there are some folks that have been traveling in the ministry and there has been a reestablishment of something called the Traveling Ministries Committee and eventually the Traveling Ministries Program within Friends General Conference that have all been part of this developing kind of uh, as uh, Patricia Loring says this embryonic development of this reemergence of spiritual gifts. Having spoken about the the theoretical and scriptural foundations and some of the process of stewarding, naming spiritual gifts and community, we need to hold up some cautions. And one of them is that we shouldn't just do this because we think it's something that we're supposed to do. There, it should really spring forth from a movement of the spirit and a necessity as perceived in the meeting. Um, Patricia Loring talks about it very clearly in her book when she talks about some caution in naming and claiming gifts. She writes, healing and spiritual growth can come faithfully through attending to one's gifts, callings, concerns, and leanings. In the present context, I want to add a parenthetical word of caution about too facile a naming and claiming of gifts. In our enthusiasm for laying hold of a positive orientation to others, and for celebration of giftedness in community, we sometimes slip into an unfortunate, superficial, mutual admiration fraught with potential harm for the community. Entering into the naming of gifts with insufficient awe and prayer can lead us to name skills or personal qualities that lack the weight of spiritual gifts. And, and this part, this next part is important because we're embedded in the world, right? The individualism of our culture actively promotes an isolated self-centeredness. It engenders a sometimes desperate and pathetic longing for marks of specialness of which Andy Warhol's sardonic 15 minutes of fame is emblematic. Too few of us are immune to this. We must take care not to overinvest in the specialness of our own gifts for or those of others even as we name, celebrate, and live into them together. So this and it's important to understand that as it uh, reemerges, it's easy to romanticize the past and say, if we just had more ministers and elders named or even recorded, you know, that would be wonderful, and then everything would be spiritual and religious, and we'd all be faithful and powerful again. And there's a dangerous tendency to romanticize. So it's important to kind of know the history to the best that we're able, but then also experience and experiment within the monthly meeting and test in testing and discernment and grounding it in a body of people, not just individuals kind of self-proclaiming themselves as ministers or as elders and then kind of doing as they please in the name of wanting to be religious and faithful. It's important that we ground these things in community. And so even though the history in the past 20 years within Liberal Friends has been developing and, and toying with and understanding and really trying to live into faithfully some of these growing edges, there's also a, a corrective that's important to acknowledge. And when one of the folks who has written about this you know, very explicitly is friend Chuck Fager. And Chuck has written an article uh, that you can read at this link here. And Chuck there in that article, which is called The Trouble with Ministers, really brings up something that's worth considering. And that is, historically, one of the things that happened in Friends is that as ministers and elders began to become more conservative sometimes, there was a beginning of some series of meetings that were called second day meetings, which met after Sunday and on Monday, and ministers and elders met there in closed meetings. And they began to have conversations and could exercise control and authority over everyone in the meeting, even if they were not a minister and elder. 
And so there was some dangerous reactionary stuff that during some of the splits in American Quakerism in the 1800s, some of this authority and the ministers and elders who were named and recorded as such was exercised very poorly. And there was lots of damaging things done. People were read out of meetings, like disowned from meetings. People were treated poorly. People left Quakerism. And there was a lot of uh, kind of somewhat violent behavior, at least spiritually and emotionally, going on. And so uh, Fager really cautions us. He says, we don't want to begin to record and acknowledge ministers and develop a two-tier system again, which is to say that friends as are here and that ministers and elders and people with acknowledged spiritual gifts are here. And I would say to Fran Fager, absolutely, we don't want to go developing kind of power levels or class struggles. And so I don't know what the way forward is. But I do know that there must be a way to us to acknowledge these gifts together in community, grounded in brothership uh, and you know sistership and you know all of that kind of the, the fellowship that kind of brings us light and life and glimpses of the kingdom. And together in those communities, know each other and that which is eternal. Name and see that which each other is bringing to the table, the gifts that they're willing to share, the things that they are uh, kind of stewarding and controlling and, and trying to kind of use in, in right use that I think that when we get together, we won't be so worried about different Quaker classes and people wearing those badges and those ribbons of gift pride, but instead we'll, be so, we'll begin to be humble with each other and lift up the power of the Spirit in our meetings and in, in the streets and in our cities and countries and in, in this world to help usher in some of, this, uh, some of this kingdom, some of the peaceable kingdom that is available. You know, the kingdom is coming and the kingdom is come. And I don't think it requires us to build a two-tier system where some people are uh, kind of more faithful than others. But it's also important to acknowledge there is such a thing as faithfulness. And we can encourage everyone and each other into walking that journey more faithfully. So we've heard the caution about being too casual in the practice of naming gifts, being not prayerful enough. And also Chuck Fager's concern that in the process of naming gifts that we run the risk of establishing a kind of a two-tiered system, class system among friends. On the other end of the spectrum, Marty Grundy lifts up that if we don't do the work of naming and claiming our spiritual gifts, we cannot live into the power and authority that is not ours, but actually comes from God. We can't live into that life and power of our meetings fully to do the work of moving in and towards gospel order. Let me read from her pamphlet, Tall Poppies. Many have heard the familiar phrase, many are called, but few are chosen. That's Matthew 20, 16. If we look at it as descriptive instead of prescriptive, and give it a Quakerly cast, we might translate it as all are invited, but few respond. We remember Jesus' parable of the banquet whose invited guests were too busy to bother attending. These are different ways of describing the phenomenon with which we are all familiar. Relatively few people dedicate their entire selves and all areas of their lives to listening for and following God's will. What happens when we are a comfortable meeting, nobody taking their Quakerism so seriously that our lives are thrown out of joint or seriously inconvenienced, and suddenly someone says yes to God's invitation? All too often that person is made to feel unwelcome and eventually leaves to find a worshiping community where people are eager to feed on the word of the Lord. The meeting, meanwhile, slips contentedly back into its self-satisfied somnolence, somnolence, its sleepingness. Just as Patricia Loring lifted up for us the fact that it is all of our jobs in the meeting community to see and to name the gifts of those in our meetings, it's also the job, the responsibility of those who have gifts named to live into them. If we have truly abolished the laity, then we each need to live into our ministry, into that place of life and power if we are going to move as a community into that process of gospel order and towards that goal of gospel order, that it takes saying yes. And she notes and notices that all too often, whether it's through 
a fear of uh, spiritual jealousy or the reaction of other people in the meeting or a false humility or a fear of our success, we don't say yes and we don't live into the power and potential that that work in service to the divine lays before us. We come up to the table, the banquet is laid for us, and we push in our chairs and walk away. So the issue is balance. It's between Chuck Fager's concern that we'll become too uh, class structured mm -hmm. and also Marty Grundy's uh, assertion that if we don't step forward in and into it, then uh, nothing will happen and we'll just kind of raise less. Uh, lay asleep. So it is this balance. We don't want to become um, separate from one another, splitting as oil and water, and we also don't want to kind of have the lowest common denominator spirituality. So the thing is to keep both of these in mind, uh, combine them together, be aware of them, hold each other accountable so we don't run into either set of those problems, and then grow into whatever that new path is, the way that is neither this nor that, but is in fact something in between and is God-given. So to close, we just wanted to say, you know, hopefully all of these things can come together and the people who should really be watching this video in terms of folks in a meeting is the nominating committee. Because it's the work of the nominating committee to sit prayerfully when considering filling the offices and committee positions within a meeting, listening for the gifts among the members of the meeting, and maybe pulling out those gifts by naming people to positions they would not have thought of naming themselves because they see, as members of the nominating committee, potential embryonic gifts in members of the meeting and are developing them by putting someone on a committee. That being said, if you're not on a nominating committee, don't think you can build us off. It is our work together to grow into this, to help each other, to nourish each other, and to let those gifts grow so that we can all join together. And that understanding of spiritual gifts is indeed one of the jewels of Quakerism.